for my entrepreneurs out there, listen up, listen up. This is for you. All right. So look with this microphone right here and this camera that I have access to already on my phone and that light back there, I'm going to be able to make as much money as I desire for as long as I desire. Right. <laughs> Think about it like this. If you could take a little $30 ring light, right? A $50 microphone and the camera phone that you already have access to, I can show you how to start a podcast. And then in the training, this is what we're going to break down. I'm going to show you and help you begin to build your authority with that podcast, right? Then the next thing I'm going to show you is how to increase your customer base. And then after that, I'm going to break down my 4P strategy. And in my 4P strategy, what we're going to show you is how you can present your products and services to your customer base online, daily, weekly, and monthly. So this is what we're going to do, right? Hit the link just down below. Sign up for the training. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. It's time. It's time for you to start your podcast and it's time for you to get paid. This shit going to be different. Hit the link. Sign up for the training. I'm going to see you inside. Welcome to the Speak Your Success Podcast. What's going on, successors? Welcome to another episode of the Speak Your Success Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Jones. And as you all know or may not know, the focus of this show is, you know, finding individuals and sharing content that's going to help you in your entrepreneurial journey. If that be, you know, uh, interviews, if that be um, tangible self-help strategies and all these things. Right. So that's what we focus here on on the Speak Your Success podcast all about. And today uh, we, we have a guest and uh, this guest, I was, I was, I was taking time and I was, I, was, I was looking her up and seeing, you know, some of the amazing things she's done. And I'm like, wow, you know, at first, you know, you, you, you see the personality and you're like, okay, that's cool. But what else, you know, like, like what else has this person done? What's a little bit more about this person's story? And then the more I began to learn, I was like, oh, oh, wow. She, she, she's the real deal out here. Right. She, she's she's the real deal. And I, I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to steal a thunder. So I'm going to let I'm going to kick her to Mike in just a second and let her give a, a, a brief introduction of herself. But um, she's she's extremely accomplished. OK. And she's shifted. She's shifted the culture like you literally can say you shifted the culture. So uh, with, so without further ado, uh, I want to welcome to the Speak Your Success podcast, Miss Gwen Jameer. Gwen, how are you doing? I'm so excited to be here with you today. Thank you so much for having me and allowing me to chat with your audience. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, so Gwen, now I'm now I'm gonna kick I'm gonna kick you to Mike, and I I want you just to take you know take take a little bit of time and you know in, introduce introduce yourself. Uh, and yeah, just 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 take a little bit of time. Take a little bit of time. So I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, talk to you and your podcast listeners. This is such an honor. I'm really really thrilled to be here. But to introduce myself, I mean, we could be here. For days, me talking about the things that I have been through, done, failures and successes and all that sort of stuff. But to kind of keep it brief, um, the short of it is I'm a serial entrepreneur. Um, I started my, the company I'm most well known for, which is Naturalicious. That is a hair care and skincare company. We are found in over 2,500 retail stores, including Sally Beauty, Whole Foods, Ulta, and a plethora of smaller independently owned stores. You can also find us online on our website, which is naturalicious.net. Um, but I've been doing that business for 11 years. And I actually started that business with $32 in the bank. I had no money. I was a newly single mother. Um, I was married before, but my marriage turned abusive. And I left that marriage because I was like, absolutely the hell no. This, this is not about to happen to me. And so I left that marriage. Um, my son was only two years old, and so I was thrust into being a single mother, which was a whole lot of emotional stuff for me because in my whole life, I had done everything quote unquote right. You know, I had graduated from college with honors. I had graduated from grad school with honors. I then got married. Well, I had a really good job. Um, I was making six figures at Ford in marketing. Um, I then got married. I then had a baby. So, you know what I mean? Like, and everything was like, life was, was going in a, a really good direction. And then for me to be suddenly thrust into this like single mother, like this, this doesn't happen to me. People like me don't get, don't deal with domestic abuse, you know? So there was a whole emotional thing um, with that. And then on top of that, I actually got laid off from my job 30 days before my divorce was final. So I went from like the mountaintop to like rock bottom, like just like that. And that is the day that I started my company. The day I got laid off from my job, I had $32 in the bank. I was like, I'm going to have to take this little hobby that I have 
of making hair products for myself that I unknowingly created um, proof of concept through my friends and family and, you know, other folks buying it, that's going to have to turn into a business because I have to feed my son. I have to pay my mortgage, you know? Um, and I loved it. And what's so funny about that story is that I actually had been praying to God to give me a clear and convincing sign as to when I should leave my job so that I could do that full time. And I don't know what's more clear convincing is like, you ain't got no money coming in. <laughs> you got a baby. So I was like, okay, God, I didn't expect you to do it quite that way, but okay. Um, and that's kind of how I started. Um, and that was 11 years, uh, that was 11 years ago, 2013, as of the time that we're recording this. Um, and since then I started other businesses. Um, I also have a membership based business for women. It's called the inner circle. That business is a, mem a it's a paid membership. They pay a monthly fee in order to have access to um, empowerment programming as well as personal development programming and travel. So once a year, we go on a fabulous retreat somewhere around the world. So far, we've been to Zanzibar. We've been to Kenya. We've been to Morocco, Mexico, St. Martin. And this year, we're actually going to Curacao. So... Um, that group is, is a lot of fun. And then after that, I started a, I opened up a salon and a spa. It was 4,500 square feet, state-of-the-art, beautiful thing. And that is the business that failed. Um, and so I've definitely had great successes and significant failures as well. That business, and I love talking about that part of the failures because I feel like when people fail at a business or a business doesn't survive for whatever the reason, right? They quietly close, right? When they open up, it's like loud and they're all like, hey, everybody got this new business. But then when they close, it's like crickets. Nobody says anything. And I think it makes other entrepreneurs feel like failure is bad. Like it makes them feel like it's abnormal to fail. And if you fail, then like there's something wrong with you. It says something about your worth and your value as a business owner and as a person. And it is a very emotional thing. But that's just not the case. And so I, I think that that's something that needs to be discussed more in entrepreneurship is that like failure is definitely a possibility. Um, it's actually more of a possibility than success, to be honest, in, in business. And um, for sure. Gwen, Gwen, Gwen. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, wait. We got to We got to stop right there. We got we got to rewind back right there because I was literally I, I was literally doing an episode. Well, I put a, I put out an episode today, actually, and I was talking about comparison, and I think that ties in so well with the failure aspect because I think when we fail, we feel a certain way because we're comparing ourselves to people who, of course, you know, are, are at, at the highest of the high, and you know, somebody might just be starting their business and they see somebody's a six figure earner and they're like, well, well, wait, I don't. I don't have the sales coming in and I don't get the dings from, from Stripe and from all these other places. Like it's, it's, it's so interesting that to hear you use those exact words, especially the ones how you talking about, we celebrate when we kick the thing off, but when we fail, we get real quiet and close it. So what, what, what can you give us? Like what were three things and we're, we're, we're going to go back. We're going to unpack everything. We're going to unpack everything. Uh, but what were three things that, 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 or, or what were a few things that you took away from from that experience failing at the salon? So um, that's a great question. And I've never been asked that before. So <laughs> um, I would say one of them for me, part, like you have to know yourself, right? Mm -hmm. For me, I can count on me, right? I know my work ethic. I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm not going to do. I know what my boundaries are. I know what I'm willing to push. Um, and I also know because I'm an entrepreneur and, and I'm an entrepreneur at heart, I'm willing to work 90 hours in a week, right? Completely unpaid, mm -hmm. right? Um, <laughs> but I personally, for me, and I'm not saying this is for everybody else, but me personally, I would never start another business that's still employee heavy, right? So my other businesses, um, one of the membership business is, it just takes me and like two other people to run that. Like that's, it's virtual, it's online, they pay a membership fee, people come in and speak. It's real simple, right? It doesn't take a lot. Mm. The mm. first business, which is Naturalicious, 
Um, we have about 10 employees at Natural Delicious, right? Um, but most of those people have been with me for years. Like my oldest employee, my longest employee at that company, I've been in business for 11 years. She's been with me for nine of those years, wow. right? And so most of the people who work for Natural Delicious have been there for multiple years. Like they've been in there since the, like we were in the trenches, we were in the basement kind of making stuff, you know. Um, so they're kind of loyal, tried and true people. With the salon... Um, I had all the capital that I needed to start that salon. Now, keep in mind, I bought that building. I did not just oh, rent wow. a space. I bought the building. I paid for the renovations out of pocket, um, the gutting the building, redoing everything. So when I first started, let me backtrack a little bit. I'm sorry. When I first started Natural Wishes, I had $32 in the bank. I had no money, mm -hmm. right? So we had to build very slowly, right? The second business was the membership business and that of course like I said doesn't take a lot of um people to run and it didn't really take a lot of money at all to start either this third business was very capital heavy um it required business loans it required a, a mortgage on the building all that sort of stuff so when the business didn't succeed it wasn't because we actually didn't have enough sales and that's I think I think that business owners are so apprehensive to share their failures when their business fails because they think it means like, oh, nobody was buying from me. And that's not necessarily the case. People close for a variety of reasons. We actually close because we had staffing issues. And mm. for me, to back to answer your question, the three things that I would do differently, I would not start a business that's so employee heavy because I can't rely on, like, we had like 35 employees out the Man. gate, right? It's a mm. big salon. We had 14 stations. 14 hair stations. We had a number of nail stations. We had, it was a spa as well. So we had estheticians. We had massage therapists. It was a whole nine, right? Mm -hmm. I personally don't do any of that stuff. I'm not a licensed hairstylist. I'm not a massage therapist. I'm not an esthetician. So if somebody decides, I don't feel like coming into work today, Gwen cannot pitch it, right? Gwen's just like, somebody has to come in, you know? And so we started having people who would say, like, it's busy Saturday, for example, um, I'm not coming in today. Why not? I just don't feel like it. I'm tired. And it's like, where do you work at? Where do you live that you can afford not to come to work on your busiest day? <laughs> right? <laughs> but okay, you know, so it was like a lot of that. Then at one point we had a woman who was really talented, but her and her husband were going through some stuff. He came up to the salon trying to start something with her. It was just like, it was a mess. And at a certain point, the math started not mathing because every time we would hire one person we would have to fire two people you know and so it's like you need a certain number of people in order to cover all the bills and the payroll and it just wasn't mathing and mathing anymore and so i had to close the building the business and subsequently sell the building um so i would not do that i would not start a business that's so employee heavy the second thing i wouldn't do is i would not take out so many loans i took out a lot of loans for that business to um, run and in the beginning it was like I thought it was a good thing because I was mm -hmm. like okay well I qualified for all these loans based upon the history of my previous businesses so my other businesses mm -hmm. were doing so well that they were the bank was willing to fund this new business and a lot of people when they start new businesses and they take out loans they have to go through a lot of different banks I got approved with the very first bank that I applied to mm -hmm. um and it sounded great, but I would not do that again. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't take out so many loans because when the business failed, guess who had to pay back all those loans? Right. Um, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, oh, no joke. Oh, yeah. oh. I know, it's painful. It's painful. Um, and then the third thing that I would do differently, that's a great question. What's the third thing I would do differently? Third thing I would do differently is I would not rush so much. I really wanted to open by a certain date. Um, mainly because, I'm just being transparent here, mainly because there's another person here in the city of Detroit where I, I live who's pretty popular. And I was told that, well, she told me actually she was going to be opening a salon as well. And I was like, oh, I got to open mine first because if I open mine after hers, then... I ain't gonna have no customers, right? So I was like, well, let me go ahead. Man. She gonna have hers. Like, I, she's gonna have her people gonna come to her just because she, she's well known. I was like, let me open by this date. 
and everything was going really well, except I was having a really hard time finding really great staff people. But I, I was dead set on opening by this date. And that goes back to the comparison thing that you were talking about, right? Like I was so gung-ho about that one date. I could have probably pushed the date further. And long story short, she didn't even she never even opened the salon. So <laughs> her salon. Mm. So I actually could have waited. Yeah, I could have waited um until I actually had like a really solid staff before I opened. But because I rushed it, my mom used to always say haste makes waste. And that could not be any closer to the truth. So those are three things I would do differently. Man. Wow. Okay. So don't take out so many loans, right? Don't take out so many loans, man, the overhead, be aware of your overhead and don't rush the, don't rush the process. Trust the process. That's a word, Gwen. That's a whole word. Yeah. Thank you for coming to. Well, don't also don't, you know, for me, don't get so employee heavy. So yes, I'm sorry. I mean, to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I mean that's what I was saying with the uh, the, the overhead. I, I I was saying overhead as in paying employees. That was my that was my thought. But yeah, I mean you 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 right on both those on, on both those. Man, so okay, so now like man, I I I just appreciate you being honest with us on that. I I, I appreciate that. You know, you 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 being in a in a position to where. You're willing to be honest enough about the journey, about the stuff that might not be as as beautiful in the midst of the storm. So thank thank you thank you for that. You know because mm-hmm. you know there, there's there's a lot of people that just they just ain't gonna they ain't gonna tell that part of the story. So so thanks Th- thanks for that. They don't want to keep it real. It, they don't want to keep it real. And it's such a it's such a disservice to other employee other other um business owners because again I've seen other people close their hair care businesses particularly in 2023 mm-hmm. when 2023 was really hard for personal care and they've just very quietly closed. The only reason I know that they're closed is because I know these people and I haven't seen them posting about their business mm-hmm. where they were like, Oh, 2021, 2020, 2022, they posting Shopify receipts. Like, look, I did 90 K this month. Look, I did 200,000 this month. All of a sudden it's like, you ain't posting nothing. Like something's going on. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I go to their website and I see that their businesses are no longer exist. The website doesn't work or it takes you to Amazon or something. This is like, you know, I get it. It's, it's, it can be a little bit embarrassing for some people if their identity is tied to their business, mm. but my identity is not tied to my business. So I'm okay with talking about it. Mm. Where, where is your, where's your identity lie? Uh, in who I am. Like I am a, I'm a mom first. Right. Um, but beyond like my titles, I am, a Christian. I love God. I am a very emotionally intelligent person. I communicate well. Um, I am uh, strong in some areas. I'm also very soft in other areas. But my identity as a woman or as a person is not like I'm I'm Gwen and I'm the owner of these businesses. Now, when people Google me, that's what they find. But that's not how I identify, right? I identify as someone who wakes up in the morning, who loves to get up at 5.30 in the morning and get her day started. I love to work out. You know, I have all these things that are beyond just being a business. I love to dance. Love, 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 love to dance. Um, You know, and like beyond just being a business owner. Like I'm not monolithic and neither are you or anybody else, but we tie ourselves so much to what it is that we do. And I think that we don't spend enough time really figuring out what our gifts are. Um, Because although I own a hair care business and I have a membership business and I'm about to start my podcast or I'm starting my podcast at the core of it. I am a communicator and I'm a teacher, right? So like my get my, the vehicle that I've chosen to utilize my gifts are teaching about hair and also teaching about business and personal finance. Those are the vehicles, Mm -hmm. but because my, my identity isn't, Hey, I'm the owner of this business. I'm the CEO of this business, or I'm the CEO of this salon, or I'm the a speaker, or whatever. I can put my gift into any vehicle, right? That I choose, and I can still utilize my gift. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, that makes and and, and the language you're using, I definitely, I definitely can relate. 
because uh, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. Because every time I hear a vehicle, I think of like Russell Brunson, how he breaks down different vehicles and stuff like that. But anyway, we, we're not we're not talking about Russell right now. Uh, but um, <laughs> so so let's re- let let's rewind back, right? Let let's let's rewind back. Uh, and I, I want to just hear your reaction to. Well, no, no, no. I, I actually I, I'll get to that in a second. Let's go back. Thirty two dollars in the account. How do we make magic happen with thirty two dollars? Like what what are what what do we get with thirty two dollars that we can make multiply? I mean, I know you're a woman of faith, so you know you like the woman with the the jars and the oil and just just oil just kept on pouring. Like what did you what did you get with the thirty two jars, Gwen? Thirty two dollars. <laughs> so that's a fantastic question. And I'm so glad that you asked it because I will also be like, well, how did you make $32 work? So here's the thing. I, because I only had $32, I had to get real creative. And Damon John has a book. I cannot think of the name of it. Maybe you can. But it's basically about starting a business with nothing and how because, oh, The Power of Broke is the name of the book. And because you're broke, you actually have the power to utilize your creativity to make things happen, right? Whereas, like, when you just have money to throw at something, you can just throw throw money at something. It doesn't really matter how creative you are. But the people who are the most creative are actually the ones who tend to kind of make leaps and bounds over over other folks, at least in the beginning, right? And if you haven't read The Power of Broke, mm-hmm. you definitely need to get it. It's a great book, whether, you're not, whether or not you like Damon John. So with the $32, I had to find ways to make that work. So here in Detroit, we have this open air market called Eastern Market. And Eastern Market is kind of, it's not really, it's not a flea market at all, but it's definitely an open air market. People sell produce, farmers come there, sell their produce. People also sell like lotions and candles and other things that they make, right? But you have to pay for a table at Eastern Market. Eastern Market probably has a few hundred vendors every single weekend, especially in the summertime. So you have to pay for a table and you have to pay for a space. I only had $32 and the table and space were like probably over $100. I didn't have that. So what I did is I had a table in my garage and I had a tablecloth. So my son at the time was two. He was still in his little carrier. He was real cute, you know. And so he had a head full of hair and I still hair about this, right? So I went to my garage and I got my table and I drove myself to Eastern Market and I set up shop and pretended like I was supposed to be there and was praying that the organizer did not come and see me and be like, who are you? What are you doing here? I figured like, okay, it's two or 300 people here. The chances of them like noticing little old me is probably kind of small, right? So let me just like hop over here on the end of somebody else's table with my table and just try to discreetly make something happen. And that's exactly what I did. So I am a person who believes in asking for forgiveness and not permission. So I was like, well, if they Mm -hmm. say you ain't supposed to be here, then I'll just be like, oh, my bad. I didn't know. Knowing I full well knew, right? (laughs) So um, my son was in his carrier and um, I would take him with me and I would sit him up on the table in his carrier and I would have my products. And people love babies, especially cute babies with a lot of hair, right? So... Mm -hmm. They do. I would that he he would attract people to the table, and they'd be like, "Oh my gosh, he's so cute!" Da, 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 right? Um, he was saying a couple like little words here and there, so they were like, "Oh my gosh, he's so smart!" And you know everything, and they're like, "He has so much hair!" And I would utilize that as my segue into talking about my hair products, and I would say, mm-hmm. "Yeah, well, actually, I use these products on him, and that's why he has so much hair." And um, you know, then I would talk about the products, and then they would buy it. And I would use that. So think about I had $32. It cost me gas money to get down there, right? So Hmm. after that, it's gone. So let's say we spent $25. So now I've got like seven, (laughs) right? But then I would sell my products at Eastern Market. And I I would sell out every single weekend. And I would use the money that I made at Eastern Market to then pay my bills at my house, pay my mortgage, pay my, I didn't have a car note. Um, pay my mortgage, pay my, you know, utilities. And then the rest of the money I would use to buy more raw materials and more packaging to then go back the next weekend and sell more. And so that's how I made it work in the beginning. Yeah, but you got, you have to, like, people always say, well, you need all this capital, you need a loan, you need a credit card. Like, no, you don't. You know, like, you need to be creative. 
you need to stop doubting yourself and you need to stop asking for permission. Just do it. Because if you ask, they're going to say no. <laughs> right? For but sure. if you just do it, a lot of times, I think I was there every weekend. I'm pretty sure those people saw me and was like, she ain't supposed to be here. But I think it was just my sheer audacity <laughs> that they were just like, let her do her thing, you know? And so that's what I did in, for the first several months that I started the company. And then after that, there was a Whole Foods store that was opening in Detroit. At the time, this was a big deal because Whole Foods were only mm -hmm. in suburbs at that time. So mm -hmm. Whole Foods in, in the city of Detroit was the very first Whole Foods to ever open in the country in an inner city. And so it was national news. It was a big deal. This was in 2013. And so I all I had at the time was my little packaging I had created um, it looked like it had been created in somebody's bedroom because it had, and it was, it looked real janky. Like I wish I could show you the, the original package. I got it somewhere around here, but it was, it was pretty terrible. I thought it was okay, but it, I'm not a graphic designer, but I had, I didn't have the money to pay a graphic designer. I did it myself. Right. Mm -hmm. I started where I was and I marched myself down to that whole food store that I knew was opening and I asked for a meeting. And I got the meeting and I pitched mm. and I got my products at Whole Foods. So it was only one Whole Foods store though that I got into originally. And, but I marketed that like it was every Whole Foods. I'm like, we at Whole Foods now, y'all. And like, you know, I was like, I was bigging it up, you know. I never said, I never lied. I never said we're in every Whole Foods or we're in, but I just said we're in Whole Foods. Which is not a lie, just completely, For sure. you know. And so that then allowed people to see me as an actual brand, as opposed to being like, mm -hmm. "Oh, this this is a cute little hobby she got at her house," right? It, people took me serious at that mm -hmm. point. Um, and then once I got that, I started milking it. I would go to Whole Foods every day at twelve. Now I live about thirty minutes from that Whole Foods, but I was down there every day at noon because right next to that Whole Foods is a hospital, and those people who work at the hospital will always go to Whole Foods for lunch at noon. I was mm. I would get my table, the same table I took to Easter Market. I would take it and I would set up shop and I would vend right by the registers. And I would I would just sit there and I would talk to them about it and I would tell them about the product and I'm like, hey, you about to go check out anybody, you might as well buy this. And um that's like yeah, I was hustling, you know. And so again, it's just about grinding, believing in yourself and actually going to get stuff done and not like sitting on your hands like waiting for somebody to come save you, because nobody's coming to save you. Wow. And you was doing this with your son with you the whole time mm -hmm. or most of the time. Yeah. Most oh, of my. oh, my goodness. So we're in whole we're in whole foods. And then you and then you still setting up a table and still moving them units. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Like back in what, the truck how, okay. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just said almost like I was, you know, in selling CDs out the back of my truck, basically. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah. That, and, and that that's like that's not easy. Like that's that's really, really not easy. Okay, so I, I, I want to unpack this a little bit more. I want to unpack this a little bit more. You said you went in and you pitched. Help us uh, help us around the pitch because I I also know that you participated in pitch competitions, right? I also know you you know yeah. you I also also know you you know you're versed in that arena. So like, let's say there is somebody, mm -hmm. and let's say that they have a product. Mm -hmm. What what's what's yeah. something that we should consider? When it comes to pitching a product, like like let's say you know maybe maybe we asked for a meeting or we hadn't even got the meeting just yet, going into it, yeah, like what is something that we should be considering to where we can make what we have, if it's created or not, mm -hmm. make make them want it. Yeah. Well, the first thing to do is to remember who your audience is, right? You have to tell them what's in it for them, because a lot of times we go in and we tell our whole story, you know. I had eczema and, you know, I, or my child had eczema and I wanted to fix the eczema. And so I created this soap and it got rid of the eczema and this is my brand and you should sell it. Okay, but how does that help me learn as a, as a store? How does it help me figure out how this is going to move units? Because that's what I want to do, right? As the, as the brand owner, as a store owner, how are you going to help me make more money? Because again, mm -hmm. what's in it for me? And I always say, that everyone subscribes to the same radio station, which is WIIFM, and that's what's in it for me. And if you can't tell mm -hmm. them what's in it for them, you will not get the sale, you will not get the deal, 
you have to go in talking about what they can benefit from, not what you can benefit from. Benefit from. You can lead with what's, what's in it for them, and then you can come back and tell the story if you want to. But the first thing is, here's how you're going to make money with my company. Here's how we're different. Here's what I'm going to do to support this brand in your store so that it moves units. Because as a small business owner selling a product to a store, um, of course, you can sell, you know, one-off products here and there online, but you also want to get that retail mm-hmm. money too, because retail money is, they're paying a, a lower amount per per product or per unit, but they're buying in volume, right? So instead of selling mm. one, um, whatever you make, let's say you make um, candles, you know, instead of one candle, they're buying 12 candles, buy a case of 12 candles. So we want to get all the money from everywhere, right? We don't want to just get just the money from the ones and twosies. We want to get somebody who's going to buy 12. We want to get multiple stores who are going to buy 12. So you got to go in there, tell them what's in it for them. That's the first thing. Secondly, if you can know exactly who the person is that you're talking to, which is not always easy, but if you know who your meeting is with, that's beneficial as well. Because you want to tell them what's in it for them as a brand, as a store, but you also want to speak to that person's um, needs and desires. So I'll give you a prime example. When I got the meeting with Whole Foods, I didn't know who I was going to be talking to. I had no clue. Keep in mind, my products are specifically made for mostly black women. And, and so we have some Latinas, um, even some like East, Eastern Indian women, but for the most part, black women, right? Very few white women buy from, buy from natural issues. Um, unless they have like a biracial child or if they've adopted a black child or they're married to a black man or something like that, right? So... When I went into the meeting, I didn't know who I was talking to, but I did know what was in it for them, right? I know that Whole Foods, as a brand, they focus specific. They love to focus on locally owned products. They love to support locally owned brands and small brands, right? So that's my first thing. So that's the benefit okay. to them. I'm a locally owned brand. I'm also black, right? Because they they're in they were coming into the city of Detroit, right? You can't come into the city of Detroit and not support black folks, right? <laughs> The trend is pretty much black, right? <laughs> so I'm a black woman. I am a small business owner. Well, I'm a black person. I'm a small business owner and I'm a woman. So just me being a black woman, those two things gives them a benefit because they want to, you know, support diversity, right? In addition to that, I have a, a product that also targets black people, right? Whole Foods sells other hair care products, but none of them were made specifically for black people. You're in the city of Detroit. You want to make money on shampoo. Because the black people who come to your come to your store, they're not buying Alafia. They're not buying, you know, Giovanni or whoever these other brands that you you have. You just they're gonna be sitting on the shelves. Don't you want somebody in your store that they're actually going to purchase? And they're gonna purchase even more because they know that I'm a black woman and they know this products are made for them. Right. So I'm speaking to what's in it for them so they can sell more units. Now, as far as the individual I was talking to. Did not know who I was going to be meeting with. So I'm in the completely in the dark. When I go to that meeting, it's a bald white man that I'm talking to. <laughs> so not only does he have no hair, so he can't benefit from more products, but he's white. He's not the target audience and he's a man. <laughs> so he's definitely against the target audience. I'm talking to him. <laughs> eyes are glazing over. Like he is just not into it. He's just like, I don't understand the, the need for this, right? He's just not getting it. Luckily for mm. me, this woman comes in and she passes the door. She said, hey, can I join this meeting? And he's like, yes, please join the meeting. She's a Latina, head full of hair, right? So I start to pitch all over. Now I'm speaking to my target, right? And she's like, you know what? I get this. Like, I'm five minutes into it. I would already talked to him for like 25 minutes. He's like, ah. I talked to her five minutes. She's like, I understand this 100%. All this hair that I have, I got two daughters that have the same amount of hair. And the the... Um, you, the unique selling proposition of my products is that there's three products in the system. Well, at the time there were three, we got more now, but there were three in the system at the time. And those three products allow you to go from wash to done in 30 minutes or less. Whereas at the time, mm. black women, even now are used to spending hours on their hair, right? So these three products will do the work of 12 products and get you done in a fraction of the time. So she's like, I got it. I got all this hair and I got two daughters with the same amount of hair. My husband's bald. He doesn't understand. But I have to get up at four o'clock in the morning just to do their hair 
so that we can all get up and get out the house at 730 to get to work and school on time. If I can take these products mm-hmm. home and I can get our hair done in a reasonable amount of time, you will have your first, first purchase order. So she's supposed to call me back in a week. Um, she took the products home. And ironically, she lives in Chicago. I don't know what she was doing in Detroit, but what's oh, what is wow. for you is for you, right? So she came, took the products. She called me back in three days and was like, Gwen, I use these products on me and my daughters. And we got up at a normal four o'clock. But we was done by 530 with three heads. And we was just sitting there for the next two hours like, oh, I guess we don't have to get up at four o'clock anymore. <laughs> And she gave me my first purchase order. But that, had I known that I was speaking to her, or had I known I was speaking to him, I would have asked if he had maybe a colleague who maybe was my target audience, right? But luckily, I didn't mm. speak to her. So the difference is, when I was talking to him, he was completely like, I don't, I don't understand this. What's the, what's the point? She got it right away because she's the target. You know what I'm saying? So if you have a way to know who you're talking to, you can then tailor your pitch to that person. Another example, and I don't mean to take up all the time, but another example of this is- No, 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 you're good, you're good. I had a pitch competition I was doing. This is the very first pitch competition I did. It was for Black Enterprise. Uh, The the grand prize was $10,000. This is still around the time when I had $32 in the bank. So I really needed this $10,000. So I um, I get 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 to the competition and I had to go on stage. Now, I also was not super comfortable speaking in front of people at this point. So I'm super nervous. I'm in front of all these people, like thousands of people are at this conference. And I'm also pitching for $10,000 that I really, 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 really need. Um, but I knew who the judges were. They told us who the judges were. And so I was able to Google the judges. And I knew that one of the judges had just had a daughter. And mm. I was able to see the daughter. She's like her, she's like a baby. She's maybe like one or two years old. And the baby's hair was really uh, coarse, right? And I remember seeing like a video of her, like trying to do her daughter's hair, or her husband trying to do her daughter's hair and like having trouble with it. So clearly I'm going to talk to that, right? Now I didn't say directly, hey judge, I can help you with your daughter's hair and make it easier to manage. But I did say, hey, and it, you know, our products are are perfect for adults, kids, and babies. Um, they're safe, they're proven effective for all ages, no matter how young your child is, even one or two years old, all the way up to 102 years mm-hmm. old, right? So I'm speaking to something that she's gonna resonate with because she knows, without me even saying that I've researched her, she knows, oh, I've had this problem with my daughter's hair. She's telling me that this is a problem, this is a solution to my problem. She's more likely to give me her vote than other people because I'm talking directly to her because that's what's in it for her, right? And then of course I talked to the other guys, the other the other two judges who were men as well, but you know she was who I honed in on because I knew that I could for sure get her vote. So and I ended up winning. Mm. Gwen, you are a marketing monster. Okay. <laughs> You are a marketing monster. Oh, my goodness. Oh, sweet, sweet baby Jesus. Like, oh, man. Like, just, just hearing you break down, hearing you break down the, the Whole Foods pitch, like how that came about, even though you were pitching to somebody who wasn't your target audience in the first place, but you still were ready to pitch to him. Then the other lady came in, and then the pitch competition Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, Gwen. Okay, we get it. Okay. If you leave with what's in it for them, it will make it so much easier. Just leave. Just focus on what's in it for them. And then your pitch is so much easier after that. I get you. I get you. What, what, okay, now I, I want to hear your reaction to this because we, 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 we're going backwards now. We're going backwards in your story. Okay. Uh, when, when, when you hear that you're the first African-American woman in history to hold a patent for natural hair care product. Like what do you, what do you feel when you hear that? Uh, I feel proud. I feel happy. At first, I was actually pretty surprised. Um, I think most people are when they hear that. They're like, "Wait a minute! Like, we're the kings and queens of hair. Like, no one's patented a hair product, and no one had until I had." But I always said that I was really proud to be the first. But I was looking forward to not being the only. And since I've patented mine, mm. 
there have been a couple other black women who have come along and patented not necessarily products, but hair related things. So like, um, there's a woman who owns a company and she, um, they make like a clip for natural hair to like kind of put into a ponytail. She patented her product and me and her actually met and she was like, you inspired me to consider patenting my product. A lot of times, you know, in the black community, um, we get really territorial about our stuff, right? Like we feel like if somebody sells their company that they've sold out, right? Or um, especially if it's, if it's a product that's targeted to black people, like hair products, for example, like, oh, you sold out, you sold out. Other cultures don't have that same sentiment. Like they're like, get your money. But what we don't always understand is that you can sell the company and still, I'm sorry, you can, yeah, you can still sell the company and still, ah, you can sell the company and still own the intellectual property, right? And that's where the money is. Mm. And so who cares mm. if you sell your company itself, if you own the intellectual property for it, like you technically still own the product, right? Because now you're getting a um, royalty or residual income of some sort from every unit that's sold of that product from that company that you sold to, which then helps you be able to empower your community even more because quite frankly, you can't help nobody if you're broke, right? And so you oh. have residual money coming in from this intellectual property that you have kept, even though you sold your company, you're then able to pour more into the community and do other things. Prime example of this is Richard Lou Dennis. Now, he doesn't have a patent necessarily, but he's someone who sold his company, Shea Moisture, and people were all up in arms about it, really, really upset, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. They sold out, sold to the white man, so forth and so on. But what did he do with that money? He created, he bought back Essence from um, a white-owned company. So he made it Black-owned again. He purchased um, Madam C.J. Walker's estate and made that that house an incubator for black women owned businesses to come and learn and, you know, just kind of pour into them. He also created his fund. He has a whole venture capital fund that solely focuses on um, black women led startups. He could never have done that as mm. the owner of Shea Moisture, only the owner of Shea Moisture, but because he sold that company for Buku Bucks, he then was able to take that and create so many more avenues for our community that actually helps other founders. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, we really got to get out of the yeah, the yeah. mindset that like selling is selling out. That's, that's ridiculous. Absolutely not. Um, companies, we have to start viewing our, our businesses. Honestly, we have to start viewing our businesses as, as um, investments, to be honest. If you have a stock and that stock is, is you know, up, it's in your best interest to sell it. Right. And when it comes to our businesses, it's like some businesses are made to be passed down. But quite frankly, most most kids don't want your business. They don't want that. They don't want the stress. They seen you grinding your fingers to the bone for 30 years. And now you want to give me this problem. No, no, thank you. Right. Most most kids don't want that. <laughs> most kids, they get the business. And what do they do? They either close it or they sell it. That's normally what happens. Statistically, that's what happens when people pass down their businesses usually. Um. But instead, mm -hmm. if, if you had the opportunity to sell your business and you own the intellectual property for it, now you've created an investment for your family and for your community because now your family is getting checks on a regular basis and they're just chilling, right? Like, we got to start viewing our businesses in this way because that's how other cultures do. And that's, they're, they're also a lot farther ahead than we are in many ways, you know? This is true. This is true. Mailbox money. Yeah. Mail mailbox money is definitely, definitely nice. And the, you know, the, the, the legacy play is always just to better position the next generation for whatever they're going to do. And yeah, that, that's really difficult mm -hmm. to do starting from ground zero every generation, right? That's really exhausting. Yeah. That's, 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 that's a really, uh, a heavy lift, but, uh, you, but you brought up, um, you brought up uh, the, the gentleman from, from who sold Shea Moisture, and then you brought up him uh -huh. purchasing Mad Madam C.J. Walker's estate. I, I, I saw that their family reached out to you? 
they um when I got back, talk 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 a, talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about like what was that like. No, like knowing her history right and what she's done in this industry and what she's done for for you know just for the culture and for our people um but then also you know seeing, seeing the, the the success that you've had in this industry as well talk talk a little bit about that experience yeah that was that was really really a huge honor for me um i actually was invited by her uh, this is a, a museum dedicated to her in Indiana. I didn't even know she was so close. I mean, I live in Michigan, so it's one state over for me. Um, but they invited me to come there and walk the halls of where she had her business. So this building in Indiana is not just a museum. This is literally the building that her products were made in and that she walked those halls and she had her employees in. And she also was somebody who made a lot of money and then poured back into the community, right? So she made all her money from her hair care businesses. And then she started um, kind of like a Mary Kay style uh, business to help women make money um, selling her products door to door, right? Um, so those women who were part of that, uh, part of her business, you know, they came through there as well. And there was a much older gentleman. He was, I don't know how old he was. He had to have been upper 70s. And he told me, he was like the historian. And he said that when he was a child, he used to go to that building because there was a theater inside the building. And he showed us where the theater was. And he said that like everybody used to come through there. Duke Ellington would come through there. Count Basie, like all these people would come through and perform in the theater inside of her, um, her building. This is an enormous building. It took up the like the whole corner block of this one particular downtown area. Um, and I was there for several hours and he he just was so gracious and he gave us this tour um, and just the memories that he had of like seeing her do her thing um, and like seeing these ma mega major stars at, of that day show up. Um, and just to know also that she had monetized this building in multiple ways, right? So she was making her products, obviously, in the building. Her corporate offices were in this building, but then she also added the theater, and it became, like, the go-to for people to buy tickets to these shows, right? So she, like, made this into, like, an event center mm -hmm. as well, um, just to see, like, the entrepreneurial mind at, the, at a time when we didn't have the internet. You know, there was no... Who, who was she going to compare herself to, right? Like, she was the blueprint for this. Um, she didn't have anybody to say like, oh, well, she did this too. So maybe I should like think about doing this. She was, she was super innovative. Um, so it was really cool and such an honor. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And they, they had me take a picture like right next to her, um, like this image of her cause they thought I looked like her. <laughs> and so <laughs> they had me take a picture. Um, and I know it got posted <laughs> online and like, everyone was like, is that her daughter? Is that her granddaughter? Like they look alike. And I'm and I don't think we actually look alike, but I do think like that particular picture, oh, like wow. the angle, we kind of favor. Um, but yeah, it was it was a huge thing, and that was really one of the highlights of that time in my life. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So I want I want I want I want to want to pivot here, just just switch switch gears a little bit. Uh, and uh, so on 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 this show, one thing I like to do is uh, I like to just get to hear like for instance okay. so this segment's called who's coming to dinner if you could pick if you could pick three okay. people living or dead and you could have a meal with them who's coming to dinner i would i would invite my mom because she's passed away and i miss her tremendously um that's probably the first person um, I would invite who else? Um, they have to be celebrities or like well-known people. Whoever you want, it's, it's your dinner. Anybody? Okay. Anybody? It's your dinner. Okay, it's my dinner. Okay. My mom. Um, I feel really bad about saying this, but I kind of I would invite my grandmother, maybe over my mom, because my grandmother died a long time ago. And my mom just died within the past mm -hmm. few years. I think I'm going to switch it to my grandmother because 
I did not know as much about her as I feel like I should have known. I ended up learning mm-hmm. that she was an entrepreneur also. And I didn't know that. She started, she was really like a renaissance woman in many ways. And although I knew my grandmother, I mean, she died when I was like an older teenager, but I just didn't know all this stuff about her. Like she started this cleaning company in like the 60s or 70s. And she had a business partner. I didn't know any of this, mm. you know, and Man. they were really successful. And they cleaned like the TV, the, the offices of the TV stations. There's three TV stations in Cleveland where I'm from, three main ones. And they cleaned all this. They had the contracts there. And, you know, this was like women weren't even allowed to like have a bank account of their own until like the like the 60s or 70s or something like that. Right. So like you couldn't even get a credit card of your own if you were a woman. So like the fact that she started a business was wild to me. Um, She was this is this was crazy. She was married to my grandfather he, from all of what I understand, he kind of he became abusive, and she left him. And she only had one child, which is my dad. So she left my grandfather, and somehow she bought a house. I don't know how she bought a house because again, women weren't allowed to really have their own mortgages at this point. But somehow she finessed something and she bought a house. And when she bought that house, it was a three-family house, a three, three, um, three. Yeah, three-family house, right? So it was a multi-unit house. She lived on the bottom floor. There was a, a unit, like, right above her and the unit above that. So I, my assumption is that she bought this for investment purposes. And mm. my grandfather, this is this is, this is is so wild to me. My grandfather was, had hit hard times, and he didn't have anywhere to go. So she let him move into her house and pay her rent. Wow. On the front, on the top floor. Oh my goodness! And I'm like, how gangster oh <laughs> is that? Like, you oh leave your husband, goodness. you buy a house, and now he got to pay you rent and live in your house. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. But um, man, there's so many other things that she did that I didn't know about that I just wish I could have talked to her about. You know, as an entrepreneur myself. Um, so I would invite her. Um, I would also invite. I would invite Sarah Blakely, who is the founder of Spanx. She's the first female self-made millionaire. Or self-made billionaire, I'm sorry. Um, mm. And she, we have very similar personalities. Um, I feel like, like we're the same person, just she has more money <laughs> and she's white. <laughs> Other than that, I feel like when I, I've actually met her, um, at an event once and she was so gracious and she I mean it was like we had a whole conversation she didn't try to rush me off it was kind of like we were old friends you know and when I look at her on Instagram and see the things that she does like I'm like this is this is me you know so I would invite her I would want to learn more from her Um, and then the third person I would invite to dinner would be I'm going to have to get this answer prepared for the next time somebody asks me this. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who else would I invite? Um, I would invite... I feel like I would invite Prince because mm. we have the same birthday and... Um, He's like a super duper creative, obviously. Um, but he was also kind of a rebel in a way. Um, he, yeah. you know, went against the music industry and we've all seen the images of him like throwing shade or looking at somebody with the side eye. I just feel like his, <laughs> he would, I feel like he would be entertaining. Um, and he could probably provide the entertainment for the night as well if he was gracious enough to play a song or two. So that's what I'd invite. Yeah, that'd be off the chain. Yeah. That'd be off the chain. Who, uh, wait, what was I going to say? Uh-uh. Okay, well, let me, so, well, so I, I, I give you the opportunity to tell people where to find you, follow you, connect with you, and I got one final question for you, then we're going to close this thing out. But where, where, where can people find you, Gwen? How can they follow you? What's the best way to connect with you? 
Well, the best way to connect with me is to go to my YouTube channel. You can simply search for Gwen Jameer, which is G-W-E-N-J-I-M-M-E-R-E. -E, and you'll find me on YouTube. Subscribe to my channel. I make content and um, videos about and episodes about personal, personal finance and entrepreneurship. Um, and you can find me on all the social media channels at The Gwen Show. There it is. Oh, but wait, we gotta. I gotta. I gotta ask this. Why? So why? Why a podcast? And why now? Oh, wonderful. Um, I get asked about entrepreneurship a lot. I've always been gotten um, questions about entrepreneurship and how to grow a business, how to start a business, how to scale a business, what to do, what not to do, and um, you know, I'm pretty transparent about it all. Like I'll share the good and the bad, the ugly, the joyful, everything, um, and I'm able to use my stories a lot to illustrate those points. Um, I've also be become keenly aware um, for years now that I have a number of gifts, like most of us do, but two of my gifts are communication and teaching. I'm really, really good at taking seemingly complex topics and distilling them down into a way that people can understand easily. And I'll like see the proverbial light bulb go off. I've done this with hair. I do it with business. I do it with personal finance. You know, I love when I talk about personal finance, just seeing people realize like making money and growing money is really not hard. It's really not complicated. It just takes discipline and it takes consistency and it takes a little bit of delayed gratification, right? If we can master those three things, you can actually, you know, really no matter what your age is, it's never too late. Like you could grow a million dollar um, retirement fund, even if you don't start till you're 45, if you do the right things, right? People always celebrate youth. And it's like, oh, well, if you start when you're 19, you know, <laughs> then you can have all this money when you retire. But some of us aren't 19 anymore. <laughs> and it's like, we feel like it's too late for us because we're 35, we're 40, we're 29, we're 60. And it's like, well, it's too late. And it's not. Um, so I love when I teach these things and they're like, oh, wow, you broke that down so simply. I had no idea I could do this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to entrepreneurship, Having been in this game for 11 years now, having owned two very successful businesses and obviously one that failed tremendously, um, I can speak to it from both sides. And I'm able to um, not just tell you how to do well, but I'm also able to teach you how to keep from doing bad. <laughs> um, and so that's a unique perspective that I think a lot of business owners um, and entrepreneurs, people who teach about that just don't have. And then quite frankly... There aren't, to my knowledge, very many, if any, black women who are teaching on these things on a consistent basis. I see a lot of um, a lot of my counterparts, they um, make content about like, here's how you can make, you know, twenty five hundred dollars this month. Here's how here's a five hustles that you can have to make ten thousand dollars this month. And those are great. Like those are perfect. But for people who actually are not looking for just a side hustle, people are actually looking to like actually start a business, actually grow a dedicated business and focus solely on that and not just have like a side hustle here and there. There aren't any black women who are talking about that. And so uh, for me starting a podcast, I feel really excited um, about the opportunity to kind of fill that void because, you know, we tend to gravitate to people that look like us. We feel like we can relate to. Um, and because black women are the number one demographic of people starting businesses. Mm -hmm. There's nobody like us talking about it mm -hmm. on actually how to do it, who has done it, you know? And so for all those reasons, um, I thought a podcast would, would be a perfect vehicle to not just teach one-to-one, because -one, I can always consult people here and there, which I mm -hmm. do, but how can I teach one-to-many? And not everybody can afford to have me come and consult them, right? So how can I give you like my best information like for free? And so hence the podcast. There it is, yeah. And then one thing, one uh, little known fact people also don't know that was well, this, this is this is some research done from a survey like a couple of years ago. Uh, but fourteen percent of African Americans are podcast hosts. Very small percentage. Very small percentage. Wow. And then even further than yeah. that, um, it, it's even been said that the what well, well for one, our community, the African American community, they said they would be more likely to listen to more podcasts if the hosts shared stories and they shared 
uh, content that really applied to them. So they're saying they want to hear from more black hosts. Uh, and huh. the one of the biggest opportunities in the podcast market is for African American women, because just to your point, wow, there's not many. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> prospectively, right? There, 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 there's not there's not many uh, out there who are in in that space. And it's yeah. a blue ocean. It's a blue ocean. Yeah. Wow. That's a really great insight. I did not know that. I would love if you could send me that cert, that research. I would love if you can find it. I would love I to like it. dig into that and see more about it. I love data. I love numbers, which is interesting mm -hmm. because I'm actually a creative. Um, but I have a little bit of an analytical side too that I like to I like to look at numbers and stuff. I, I get it. And, I mean, but you but you're like a massive marketing mind. So I can see how the numbers make sense to allow you to create. Like I can see how how it, go, how it goes yeah. together. Yeah, I can see how it goes together. Uh, but but Gwen, we're about to get out of here. Last last thing, I want to kick you to Mike and give you. I mean, you said you've get, given a lot of value here tonight. You've also, um, you know, sh share some marketing stuff, pitching stuff, like all that good stuff. Sharing your story, like amazing. Uh, but is there a final word you want to leave with the people? If you would, you have the floor. Sure. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, first, I have to tell you, you're a great interviewer, by the way. So <laughs> um, I've really enjoyed um, talking with you tonight. Um, so the one thing that I would say is that waiting is not a wealth strategy. Wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H. Waiting is not a wealth strategy. When I say that, what I mean is that we are oftentimes, the older we get, the more we're waiting. We're waiting for the right time. We're waiting for, you know, our kids to graduate high school to start something. We're waiting for, you know, summer to come. We're waiting for us to get the promotion at the job, whatever it is. Like, whatever you want to do, all you're doing is delaying your wealth and the pop the opportunity that you have to grow that in that space, right? Because the only time we can't get the only thing we can't get back is time. And so the longer that you wait for the quote unquote right, right opportunity, the longer you delay it. Because what happens when we wait for the right opportunity? Something else inevitably comes along and throws us off kilter. And now we've got to wait again and we just keep waiting. How many times have you wanted to start a business and you keep telling yourself, oh, I'm going to start it when this happens? Or for podcasters, how I know there's people who are listening who are like, oh, I really want to start a podcast. And it's been two or three years that they've been wanting to start this podcast instead of just getting it going. Um, and just any endeavor that you want to do, just get it going. Don't delay it. There will be no right opportunity. There will be no right time. Um, and if you continue to wait, you're just delaying your joy, your happiness, and ultimately your wealth. And your wealth is not just money. It's also, again, your happiness, your fulfillment, all those things. So don't delay it. Just get it done. What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is that it doesn't work out. But then you'll still be, at least you'll know, you know? Um, and so that's my that's my advice is to just jump. Jump off that bridge and build your parachute on the way down because none of us have all the answers. I'm still trying to figure things out and I've been doing this for 11 years already. So, Man. There it is, Gwen Jamit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Gwen, for taking the time to rock with us uh, on, on this episode. Thank you for all the value you shared. If y'all did not get any value from this episode, then you need to rewind it and you need to play it back one more time because you, you, you missed all the, all the game and all the gems that were dropped. And uh, I just want to encourage you all to definitely follow Gwen, connect with Gwen, because she puts out amazing content. Uh, and, and she's really creative on how she does it and really engaging. And that's how I found her. I said, wait a minute. Huh, okay. Yeah, let's see what she's talking about over here. So, yeah, I, I would encourage everybody to follow to follow and connect with, with Gwen. And uh, also, if you're out there and you made it to the end of the episode, I would just encourage you to go ahead and follow the podcast. It says Speak Your Success. You can type in Speak Your Success Media and we'll pop up on all your platforms, YouTube and everything like that. But until next time, family, this is the Speak Your Success podcast where we help you speak your success, believe in your greatness, and continue to create the life and business of your dreams. Why would you and why should you live any other way? <laughs>